Thank you all for coming. Uh, I know it's a tough time of year based on the fact that we got keystones and finals and all those different things going on. So I do appreciate you guys coming out here today. Uh, I'm excited for this presentation. I'm excited for these conversations because as much as uh, you know, we focus on getting better as student athletes and getting better at our craft and getting better at our skills, we are never gonna arrive when it comes to getting better at the mental side of sports, okay? And it's something that as an athlete, high school athlete, I struggled with, collegiate athlete, struggled with, but got better. Uh, but as a professional, I felt like, when I was playing overseas, I felt like the mental side of sports I got much better at. Visualizing success, uh, imagining, using the five senses to imagine myself being successful. And there's no guarantee that if you work on mental training that you're gonna hit the ball hard or make more shots or score more goals. But there's a guarantee if you don't work on those skills, you're never gonna get better, all right? So my hope is that you take one or two things from, from today and, and inter, you know, bring them into your own athletic career to find a way uh, to reshape the way you think about when you make a mistake, when you fail, when you mess up, uh, how you prepare for a game, all those things. Uh, I'm very excited to, to welcome our guest, Will Mailer. I've spoken to a lot of you guys about Will, uh, former Division I baseball player, uh, played in the minor leagues for a little bit, and then has been devoting his life and his career uh, to working with athletes. Um, works, he's coming all the way in from Austin, um, but has worked with um, MLB, NBA, PGA, uh, athletes, and, and the mental side of sports. So I'm really excited. Uh, let's give Will two claps, please. Thank you guys. Uh, thanks so much, Dennis. And like he mentioned, you know, it's uh, I, as as a young athlete, this is this is stuff I, I really could have used and, and wish I learned sooner. So what we're going to talk about today, uh, just a couple of key stories uh, that I think you'll find uh, both entertaining and valuable. That'll provide some great references from some of the best athletes in the world, uh, as well as three tools. And that's why I, I asked you guys to grab a. Uh, couple of pieces of paper. My ask for you guys is to you know, absorb as much as you can here, but just like lifting weights does with your body, the mind is, is just as similar. So I ask you to practice these and uh, I'll share my contact information afterwards. So if there's any questions uh, following the presentation, I know Dennis is going to share you know, my information and be more than happy to reach out to you guys individually. So going to talk briefly just about you know, the, evolution, the evolution of, of the athlete. So since I think professional sports have been around, athletes have always been looking for an edge. And I think that really came to the forefront in the 1980s. Athletes started lifting weights. They started looking into the science around it. Athletes started to get bigger, stronger, faster. Following the weight training era, they got into dietitians. They started getting you know, sports nutritionists. Athletes really were getting concerned about what they were put into their body to complement what they were doing off the field with the weight training. More recently, analytics started becoming involved. You look at the, the movie I referenced here, Moneyball, you might have seen with Brad Pitt, where organizations like the Oakland A's, the New York Yankees, the Boston Red Sox, started hiring Ivy League grads to help them make better decisions. Now more recently, athletes have gotten so specific with their training. Guys like Tom Brady has his organization called TB12 where he has a personal trainer, a throwing coach to work on his mechanics. Guys like Steph Curry have a professional shooting coach that travels with them to the games. They've gotten so specific with their training because athletes are always looking for an edge. Now, what happens is, is all these things, the weight training, the nutrition, the specific coaching, that used to give you an edge. Now, if you don't do those things, if you don't put the effort in in the weight room, you don't take care of your body, you don't work on your skills, whether that's a, a baseball swing, a jump shot, or a throwing mechanic, that, you just need to do that to maintain, right? If you want an edge, and I promise you, they're already starting to see it with analytics and the advanced coaching, the real edge is in the mind. 
And a couple of the stories I'm going to share with you today are with three of the greatest athletes, if not all time, definitely of the modern generation on how they utilize their mind to gain an edge. Go back one. First one is Michael Jordan, six-time world champion, many think is the greatest basketball player of all time. A little bit before your all's time, but I grew up watching Mike. An, an intense competitor. The first story about him is he was cut from his varsity basketball team as a sophomore. Thought about it every day and at a young age instilled that work ethic. You all might have seen the most recent documentary, The Last Dance, which came out uh, last springtime on the Chicago Bulls 1998 season. And what I found really compelling from that story was how Michael would utilize stories that he actually made up in his head to motivate him. So they were playing the Washington Bullets, which uh, was the Washington Wizards before they changed their name. And a young guy on the Bullets had a, had a big game against him. And he said, you know, hey, hey, Mike, nice game. Michael found that a little bit disrespectful. So he went and told all his teammates. And they played them the next day. And I think he, he shut him, that, that young guy down to like five points. And Mike had about 40. And what they came to find out afterwards is that incident never even happened. He made it up, told it to his teammates, thought about it himself because he wanted to utilize that as fuel. And he thought, and that, that kind of visualization, that kind of self-talk, making up some things are, is one of the key ways to motivate yourself. And Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant were probably the two of the best of all time at that. Next athlete, Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods, arguably the greatest golfer of all time, grew up with a uh, father, Earl, who was a former Army Ranger. So uh, Earl, at a very young age, would implement some of the military mental training tactics uh, to Tiger as he was golfing. Things like throwing golf balls or golf gloves in the middle of Tiger's backswing to distract him. He would uh, actually hire his friend, who was a military psychologist, to do hypnosis with Tiger to help with his mental rehearsal. All of these to instill a mental toughness at probably about age seven, and that's why Tiger was able to not only win, his, you know, I think 82 golf tournaments and 15 majors, but overcome some of the personal trials and tribulations which led to his most recent comeback. And the third athlete I'm gonna talk about is Tom Brady, who's still playing. I don't know if you guys know the story about Tom, but Tom was wildly under-recruited before he went to Michigan grinded his way as a, from, a, from a fourth string backup to the starting quarterback, ended up becoming a, one of, the, I think, six round draft pick when he was thinking he was gonna get drafted in the top three, had six quarterbacks drafted ahead of him. Borderline in tears with his family thinking he wasn't gonna get drafted. When he got to the Patriots, he told the owner, Robert Kraft, that it was going to be the best decision the organization ever made. And that confidence, that self-belief, along with reminding himself every day that six guys were better than him, he said he thinks about that every day when he goes to work, and that is why at age 44 years old, or approaching 44 years old, he just won his seventh Super Bowl and is still one of the best players in the game. Can you escape to go to the video real quick? So, the video I'm going to share here is from a, a, arguably the greatest college coach of all time, Nick Saban, and it's, it's a called The Illusion of Choice. I'll play it real quick and then we'll talk about it. Uh, you know, these guys sort of don't, they all think they have this illusion of choice. Like I can do whatever I want to do. Uh, and we kind of have a younger generation now that doesn't always get told no. Uh, they don't always get told this is exactly how you need to do it. Um, so they have this illusion that they have all these choices. But the fact of the matter is, is if you want to be good, you really don't have a lot of choices because it takes what it takes. You have to do what you have to do to be successful. So you have to make the choices and decisions to have the discipline and focus to the process of what you need to do to accomplish your goals. And all these guys that think they have a lot of choices are really, you know, sort of sad and mistaken. And I think, as we all have done with our own children, um, 
they learn these lessons of life uh, as they get older. And sometimes the best way to learn is from the mistakes that you make, even though we all hate to see them have to make them. Uh, and we don't really condone them when they do. So the reason I brought up that clip, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very well said. So I'm able to work with athletes you know, as young as high school all the way up to the professional ranks. And what you guys will find out is as you move up each level, you can ask myself, you can ask Coach Dennis, the talent level rises. And when, when the talent level rises, the margin for error gets smaller and smaller. And what Coach Saban's referencing here is a, a little bit of context, is that he routinely gets the number one recruiting class in the country. So when you're dealing with athletes of that caliber, a lot of those athletes have never been challenged physically. They've always been the best. But to reach an elite level, to go from that high school to division one, to division one to professional, from professional to the very best, you need to make good choices. And what he's saying is choices on and off the field. Right? We already talked about you know, the weight training, what you put into your body, but also what you do off the field. Now, not to talk ill of, of certain athletes, but a, a, a sad story, and someone who I met personally offered to work with, Johnny Manziel, not sure if you know the, the quick history of Johnny, but uh, a five-star recruit out of Texas, uh, went to Texas A&M, became, I believe, the first freshman to win the Heisman Trophy, national fame, was uh, hanging out with LeBron James, Drake, and ended up being a first round draft pick by the Cleveland Browns. And you talk about someone that had the highest of highs, someone that did not make good choices. Let the fame get to him, let the drinking, let the drugs, and literally washed himself out of the league and has been interviewed recently saying he, he wasn't mentally and emotionally capable of handling it. Needed someone, you know, a coach, a mentor, but when you, make the, when you have those bad habits and those patterns of making poor choices at a young age and no one holds you accountable, it can lead to that self-destruction. So you can obviously look up more of his story, but I wanted to share that as a cautionary tale because while we love to tell the, the redemption stories of the, LeBron, or the Michael Jordans and the Tom Brady's, when you make the incorrect choices routinely and don't handle yourself the right way mentally and emotionally, there can be a catastrophic fall as well. So we're gonna, that's gonna lead me into the first exercise we're going to do today. Uh, wanted to share a little, just a teaching moment. The three of the most dangerous words in the English language are I know that. And what I mean by that is you may have heard this tool talk before, or you might have heard something similar. All I ask is you keep an open mind and, and do your best you can to absorb the information. And briefly, just to, this will help you in uh, pretty much when you're being coached or taught, the four stages of learning. So if this is something new to you, uh, we'll be entering that first stage. So the first stage of learning is called unconscious incompetence. And what that means is you don't know what you don't know. Some, like a coach is telling you, you know, to fix something in your swing or your shot that you never heard before. Second stage is conscious incompetence. You now know what you're doing incorrectly. The third, conscious competence. You're now able to make that correction, but it takes a lot of thought and effort. And fourth, unconscious competence. And what that is, it becomes a habit. And for anything we're really striving to, to do or work on, that's what it takes, both mentally and physically. We just need to get to that place where what we're really striving for, whether it's a movement pattern or a new habit, it becomes automatic. So the four, first tool I'm going to teach you is what's called a reset. Get that reset page. Now the number one thing athletes come to me for is for at, at all levels is emotional management. Now it could be in a crisis where something happened in their personal life or something as the, like they call it the yips where they lost their putting stroke or can't shoot anymore. True story, uh, we work with a lot of uh, professional sports agents and this past season, the, one of the agents called us and said, hey, we got, we got an emergency. A pitcher with the Washington Nationals is, is a wreck. He's, he's literally having panic attacks he, before the game. 
and we, can you guys help him? So we jumped on a call, and the next day, and we taught him this tool, which is we call it a reset. So most of us, when we're feeling down or depressed, angry, in a, call it an emotional state that we don't really like, we tend to just wait for something good to happen to get us out of that state. Now, what we teach our athletes to do is to take ownership of the process of changing how we feel, and I'm gonna teach you that process today. So we're going to do this together, but what we're going to do, and this is called a reset, we're going to stand up, now, if you're right-handed, I'll tell you guys when to do this. If you're right-handed, we're gonna put your left hand over your right, and what you're going to do is you're going to close your eyes, and you're going to squeeze as hard as you can to the point that your forearm should be shaking. As your eyes are closed, you're going to take two big inhales through the nose like this. And then it's going to be a release, an active exhale. So it'll look something like this. You're going to shake it out. And then when you open your eyes, you're going to have a wide view. So all right, everyone to stand up. Okay. Now I'll walk you through it again. All right, stack your hands. Close your eyes. Now squeeze together with max intensity for about, you know, your arms should be shaking. Two big inhales through the nose. Release. Shake it out. Eyes open. Last step, arms crossed. And pick a word. I used to say calm or relax. Calm. All right, now that you know how to do it, let's do it one more time. Eyes closed, stack the hands, squeeze to max intensity. Good, two inhales, release, eyes open with a wide view, arms crossed, relax. Good, have a seat. So give me, I need a couple volunteers, give me some feedback. How did you feel after that? Somebody. Yes. You kind of get like a moment of clarity after, like a second or two, when it's just like really relaxed for a second, you kind of regroup and get your thoughts back together. Beautiful. That's, that's said perfectly. Anybody else? I'll call on somebody. Yeah. Uh, you kind of like empty your mind. Beautiful, yep. So the value of that is, you know, I had the, the slide up there before with the, like the iceberg. Emotions have two things. They have what's called a peak and a pit, right? So a pit is a negative emotion. Now time, we let, we let something go long enough, like we're in a bad mood, we get in a fight with you know, one of our friends or family members, we have a bad game, that emotion will eventually pass. But why let time be the reason emotion passes? What this does, what the active reset does, is because you're using your physiology, we say physiology creates feelings. You're intentionally using your physiology of, we call it targeted tension, and then releasing it. You're now able to get to that peak or that pit of emotion within 15, 20 seconds. And like this new gentleman mentioned, you're now back to neutral and when you're at neutral, now you can decide how you want to feel. You can make a better decision. And some people say, well, hey, Will, why would anyone want to get down from a peak? Sometimes athletes get too high, right? You're maybe, you struck out the side and you have to go bad and you're too intense, right? Or you know, if you're a quarterback, you might not want to be too excited. You might overthrow your receivers. All of our athletes have what we call a set point. And that's more so the, the, the analogy we like to give is you're a thermostat versus a thermometer, right? You get to decide what level of intensity. For some, it's a seven out of 10, an eight out of 10. Other athletes operate better at a five or six. I don't know what it is, it depends on the individual, but don't be a thermometer. Don't let circumstances dictate 
how you're going to feel, be a thermostat. Set that, and really the first step I challenge you to do for the next week is awareness. We're all gonna have uh, these, these negative thoughts, which I'm gonna talk more about in a minute, but the minute you start to feel a negative emotion, catch yourself, that'll be a new habit you're implementing, and reset, and the challenge I give to you is see if you can shrink the gap from the time that negative thought happens and that negative emotion to when you get back to neutral. Because I promise you, when you talk about the high level of sports, the guys and, the guys and gals that are able to get over a negative play or like throwing an interception and reset for the next play are the ones that are going to succeed long term. Uh, keep going. We kind of talked about this. Physiology. Keep going. Um, yeah, we talked about the reason this works is you know, the physiology, changing that is the quickest way, using our body first. And what this is doing with this reset, interrupting that pattern, is we're creating what's called a new neural connection or a neural pathway. And just like building your physical muscles, these can be trained. So it takes about 30 to 90 days to implement a new habit. So if you start tomorrow, a month from now, you could create a new neural pathway, a new neural connection, which will, this will just be like you know, clockwork for you guys. Yeah, so we, we already did this, but uh, keep going. Okay, uh, cool. All right, next topic we're gonna talk about is the power of language. So I'm gonna share a video in a second, but one of my, one of my favorite stories when it comes to the power of your words is from the 1986 World Series. So a year before I was born, um, the Boston Red Sox were in, were, were deemed to be cursed. They, they hadn't won a World Series since uh, the famous Babe Ruth got traded to the New York Yankees, and they were on the verge of winning their first World Series uh, in, I believe, like almost 70 years. And a player on their team, Bill Buckner, uh, a very good first baseman, multiple gold glove winner, was the, uh, going into that game. They were one game away from winning the World Series, and a, an interesting turn of events happened. And I'm gonna play that video real quick. So obviously that ground ball went through Bill Buckner's legs and subsequently the Mets won the next game and won the World Series. Now, what came out actually within the past year was some footage of Bill Buckner in an interview a week before the World Series. And I found this fascinating. Yeah. Had a great series and win, and uh, the nightmares are that you're going to let the money run, uh, score on a ground ball through your legs. So. <laughs> so this guy just said a week before the World Series that his greatest fear was that he let a ground ball go between his legs and they lose the World Series, and that happened. Now is that magic? No, but what he did is he planted a seed in his subconscious mind that made it more likely to happen. And a recent Harvard study showed that if you say something out loud, it's 10 times more likely to happen. It's 10 times more intense. And if that statement you say is negative, it's an extra seven times more likely. So instead of just letting this automatic negative thought, we call them ants pass, when you verbalize it, and I've done it a million times, I play golf all the time, hit a bad shot, ah, oh, I stink, or I, I, I can't do it today. I'm telling my brain that, and the brain wants to be correct, right? So we need to be very, you should be very conscious, and this should be a cautionary tale of the power of the words. So we're gonna, I'm gonna have you, this is a very, very passive exercise, but I'm gonna have you write down a few phrases, and you can just keep these for yourself, but the second key point about language is one, 
say these in the positive terms, meaning the brain does not understand negation. Does anyone know what that means when I say the brain doesn't understand negation? Anybody? Okay. So the example my, my business partner likes to use with his kids is when he says, when the kids are jumping on the couch when they were younger, he would say, don't, don't jump on the couch, right? But the way the human brain works is when you say don't jump on the couch, your brain has to think jump on the couch and then not do it. What's better to say is sit on the floor. So when you're, when you're starting to build your self-talk, make sure it's in the positive frame. And second, it's something you can control, right? So when I work with my baseball guys, they, you know, they, they would talk about their, what they want to say to themselves, say, we say get a hit. Well, getting a hit necessarily isn't within your control. So something positive that's within their control would be see the ball, be easy, be relaxed, I'm unstoppable. So think whatever your primary sport is, I want you to think, take, take a couple minutes here and think of three phrases that you can implement into your self-talk that you can utilize you know, for your performance event, for your games. Go ahead, take, take a minute. And I'd be happy to review any of these with you after if you want any feedback. seconds. Let me hear some of these. All right, I need a volunteer or two. I just want to hear what you guys came up with. Yeah. Sure. What's your sport? Track and football. Okay. So the first one uh, for track and for us, I said stay calm in the circle. Um, because like running is really a mental game, especially for me. Like, I have a really bad week. Week. Okay. And whenever I, I think I'm not going to throw all, I like I struggle with that. So um, just like take a breath and stay calm before I throw. Um, next year for football, I said think and breathe before the snap, and then okay. envision your moves before you do them. Okay. Um, kind of like to know what I'm going to do before it happens, so I'm not scrambling in a moment. Yeah. All great. Good job. Anybody else? Yeah. Love it. Give me one more. Um, I just have relax and stay smooth. Uh, we talk about that a lot. Just relaxing. Um, uh, me, I do like a lot of breathing and stuff for my races. Just focus on, on getting to the finish line, but not letting what's around me affect me. Um, because I, I run my best when I'm under not a lot of pressure. 
Great. Like I ran one of my best times of the season in a meet where well, it was just in a, like a mock meet. It was just me and my teammate, and I was under no pressure whatsoever. And it was the second best time I've ever run because I was just so relaxed and I, I was not afraid of anything because there was nothing on the line. So we go over just trying to relax and then staying smooth in my race. Well, that'll help you. If you, if you, if you start having that self-talk, that'll just be part of your new routine. And we're going to talk about something. Remember that moment you talked about. It's going to uh, connect to what we're going to share next. So the last tool I'm going to teach you guys is called anchoring. And outside of emotional management, what, what athletes and coaches typically ask for our help on is consistency. They say, Will, why, why do I have a great game, you know, four for four or throw you know, five touchdowns on Friday and then a week later you know, I'm 0 for four or I throw a few interceptions. Why is, my, why is my performance a roller coaster? Why can't it be like a steady flow of high performance? So a lot of it comes down to mindset and body chemistry. So what we're gonna do with anchoring is teach your body how to have a connection with your mind to get your physical body in the state that it was when it performed best. But to provide some context, how many of you drive? Raise your hand. All right. Anybody been pulled over by a cop? Okay. <laughs> what did that feel like when you saw those red, white, and blue lights? It was horrible. Describe the physical feeling. I was very anxious. I was mad at myself because I knew what I was doing wrong. Okay. Now, is that because when humans were created, that when we see red, white, and blue lights, that's what our natural response is? No. It's because we've conditioned to seeing red, white, and blue lights to pain, right? We, can, we, we, we play that movie out in our head, right? We see that and like, oh no, I'm gonna get pulled over, I'm gonna lose my license, I'm gonna have to go to you know, driver's school, whatever, I'm gonna be in trouble, and all that we associate to negative feelings. And that's through what we call conditioning. But what if, we could condition the, the feelings that we want on command. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So the next tool is what we call a power move. Now anchoring is, anchor, what anchoring is, it's the process of associating an internal response with an external trigger. So just like working out your body, you're going to need to condition this daily. It's called neuroassociative conditioning. So before we stand up, the, the gentleman in the, in, just mentioned that the track story was a great one. I want you to think of, take about 30 to, seconds to a minute to think of in your, in your primary sport, your best sport, the best you've ever performed. Think of that in as much detail possible. So take about a minute, find that story and that reference, and then we'll move to the next step. Anybody need more time? Good. All right. So everyone stand up. Now what's this called? What this is called is a power move. So my conditioned move is when I hit my right pec, I will still feel a shot of adrenaline, a chill down my right arm. Now you all can condition this now that you, once you know the steps to whatever you want, but for unison, I want that move to be something you probably haven't done. So we're gonna take our right hand and our, and our left hand like this. And when I say to the count of three, we're gonna hit it together and we want a, we want a word too. So we're gonna say, it's gonna look like this. One, two, three, yes. All right? So you have that sports memory. So everyone close their eyes. Think of that game, think of that moment, and then really, we say, see the picture. See exactly what that moment felt like. See the crowd, see your teammates, see the opposition, hear the sounds, hear what the, the t your teammates are yelling, hear any audio in the background, the fans. Feel the feelings. How did you feel? Was it, was it excited? 
Was it adrenaline? Was it just ultimate confidence? Get to get there like you're there. Now, once you hit that peak emotion, I'm gonna count down to three, and then we're gonna hit our hand with that move and say yes. So, one, two, three, yes! One, two, three, yes! Last time, one, two, three, yes! Good, y'all can see. So what this does, and this is probably my favorite thing to teach, if you do this enough, and you implement the other two steps, if, when times are tough, you reset to neutral, you have a routine where you're telling your body and your brain what you want to happen, and then in part of that routine, you get your body chemistry into a peak state, I guarantee you, your success will look a lot more like this versus this roller coaster of emotions. That's all I got for you guys today. Thank you. Guys, does anybody have any questions? Could be about the presentation, could be about your own uh, mental journey in your sport. While we have Will here, does anybody have any questions or any reactions or thoughts? Yes. Um, so when you were playing in like college and like the pros and stuff, like why did you decide to go to like mental work? Is that something you struggled with a lot? Yeah, I was a very emotional player and I was this this roller coaster of emotions. I think in college, my freshman year, I finished off 0 for 25 and then into our summer league, I mean it was almost became like comical. You know, I, I got a standing ovation for like my first hit of the summer, it was like August. So I knew it was it wasn't physical. Right, because I would have games also where I perform against some of the best in the world and do very well. So I knew I was missing some connection. So I wanted to utilize, you know, kind of the struggles I had to to as as a positive to to help others. And I'm and I'm kind of analytic anyway. So I like to teach it. I like to kind of always looking for like I was as an athlete looking for a way to get better. And there's so many tools out there now. Like I mean, we've learned these fairly recently, re recently with the reset and you know this neuroassociative conditioning. So it's uh, I, I just, my only regret is I wish I, I learned it in high school and college, not not post. Yes. Um, so in boxing, I like sometimes when I'm like trying to tell myself to think positively and try to imagine success, it starts turning into a negative thing, and I start to think like negative thoughts that lead to failure. How do I change that? Okay, so you're, I'm going to dig a little deeper. So you're, you're trying to think positive, right? So when you say that, are you like envision, are you visualizing yourself doing well? Or are, you, or are you telling yourself like, oh, I should be more positive? Kind of both in a way. Okay, and what happens as you're thinking that you start having negative thoughts yeah, come in? It starts causing my brain to think of negative thoughts. Okay, so that's very natural. So the human brain was not wired for success, it's wired for your survival. Has everyone ever told you that? Have you heard that before? Okay, yeah, so we're, we're, we're self-protecting animals. So we think of these negative thoughts because those negative thoughts are going to push you from potential failure and pain, right? If you don't try or if you went into it as, like, as a defense mechanism. So what I would recommend to you is just be aware of those thoughts and remind yourself you are not your thoughts. Those are just your thoughts trying to protect you from comfort, right? Because to get to a next level, it's gonna be scary to your brain because you're doing things you've never done to achieve something you never have. So just, I, that would be the, the mantra I give yourself is I am not my thoughts and then change your physiology through that reset. And you'll start to see your self-talk will change for the better. It'll start, you'll start to believe what you're saying because your actions will back that up. Yeah. I'd be happy to stay after too. I got plenty of time. So if you want to ping me one on one, I'll, I got, I'll be here for like another hour. So happy to chat with you guys if you don't want to stay in front of the group. Guys, I think the most important thing, and I really appreciate you bringing up that question. I think the most important thing is that all of our journeys are a little bit different when it comes to like, how we become faster runners, better swimmers, better basketball players, football, field hockey, tennis, golf, whatever it is. When we're trying to acquire a skill and get better at the skill, you have to work at it. 
when we're trying to be better at the mental side of sports, if those negative thoughts creep into our, uh, our mind when we're trying to visualize, when we're trying to reset, when we're trying to focus, it's gonna take practice to negate those thoughts or to accept those thoughts and understand that they're not really who we are, but it's part of our being, it's part of our maturation. And I think the sooner that you are working on these things that Will is talking about and identifying and being vulnerable about those thoughts, the closer you're gonna to get to a better peak performance. Uh, because it's natural, just like it's natural um, to miss a catch or to miss a shot. It's also natural when you're working on the mental side of things to have those negative thoughts creep into whatever you're trying to train your mind to do. I think what I love best about what Will talked about is you're connecting the mind to the body. Think about any skill that you do in your sport, any skill you do in your sport right now. If you can connect your mind to your body to hitting a tennis ball or to throwing a discus, your mind and your body are working together to, to, uh, to functionally uh, conduct that skill. The best players are aware of what their body's doing when they're successful, and the best players are aware of what their bodies are doing when they're not successful. It's the same thing that holds true with mental training. Like, if you're doing something, if you're mentally visualizing yourself being successful, and you find success in that exercise, do it again. Get better at it. Keep working at it. There's no like direct formula. These are awesome takeaways. These three uh, acts are great things. These three exercises are gonna be great things that I hope to see you guys implement. And make it your own. It might not look exactly like what Will talked about today. Make it your own, okay? Because you have your own thoughts. You have your own uh, mental approach to the game. So try to make this your own here today. Does anybody have any other questions or anything? Let's give Will two big claps here. Awesome. If anybody has anything you want to say one-on-one -on -one or hang out, whatever, thank you all very much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate soon. it.